right, so I'm calling this fossil hunting in the Yemen, archaeologists without borders. Now here's the thing, right? Huge parts of the planet's potential contribution to science is being overlooked due to instability. Now I think this is a tragedy for science, and I also think it's a tragedy for these places. Now I'm actually a Neanderthal specialist, but I also specialize in fossil hunting in caves in unstable, hostile, and disputed territories. Because we all need to unwind somehow, right? <laughs> I'm also a stand-up comic, so apparently when I'm not digging, I'm gigging. <laughs> That's the level of humor, guys, get on board. <laughs> so, um, I'm actually English, do we have any English people in the room? That's like, that's quite an English response. It's like, yes, but we don't want to admit it. Uh, so I'm English, but I'm actually of Arab heritage. So uh, I'm from Yemen and Syria. So basically I'm a one woman axis of evil. <laughs> an axis of evil with the voice of Mary Poppins. <laughs> evil that's practically perfect in every way. So I was genuinely brought up on this steady stream of revolutions, political imprisonments, secret police, and hummus. <laughs> it means that I'm less likely to be phased by places that are normally overlooked because of security. But I really, really need you to not think that I'm a violent person, because genuinely the only thing I've ever killed is the mood. <laughs> Which I, I do a lot. Um, I can see some of you look a bit nervous about some of these jokes. Um, guys, remember, if you don't laugh, the terrorists win. <laughs> so get on board. Um, so one of these places is the breathtakingly beautiful uh, Yemen. So uh, this is not a special house. This is just our next door neighbor's house. Uh, this place is known for its epically beautiful buildings. This is a picture my brother took of the UNESCO World Heritage Site in Sana'a, the cap capital. It doesn't look real. This is another UNESCO World Heritage Site. It's known as the Manhattan of the Desert because it's filled with these ancient skyscrapers. Now, some of you are probably wondering why I'm showing you pictures of Yemen. I'm not a member of the Yemeni National Tourist Board. It's, the, it's really actually very difficult to care about a place that you don't know anything about. And I need you to care about Yemen because we are running out of time. See, sadly today, mostly Yemen is known for war and Al-Qaeda. Um, of course, in the 90s, it was actually known as the place where Chandler Bing from Friends <laughs> ran off to to avoid having to break up with Janice. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie, I get it, breakups are hard. I'm still not over the breakup of Pangea. Yeah. So, uh, do we all know what pandas are? Do we all know what pandas are? Well, I don't know. Some of you might be from the future. <laughs> that was an extinction joke. Congratulations if you got it. <laughs> See, here's the thing. I'm an archaeologist that specializes in mostly extinct human beings. I'm a paleoanthropologist. And to paleoanthropologists, Yemen could, it could be a paleoanthropological gold mine. See, notice Yemen's proximity to Africa where we believe we began. Now, we've always assumed that we left Africa via the Sinai of Egypt, but Yemen's a quicker route. You could see it from Africa back then. So the question is, did our ancestors cross the Red Sea? Did we do a Moses? Now, sadly, all the foreign and international archaeological teams left Yemen in 2011 because of instability. So I knew what I needed to do. I needed to set up a team that would be able to work in this kind of an environment. Um, we were looking for areas with four criteria, that met four criteria. One is that it should be in the kind of terrain that might contain caves. Because when you're looking for really old fossils in that kind of heat, your best bet for preservation is always caves. Um, we were also looking for areas with the right geological age. Because if you're looking for like 50,000 year old fossils, there's no point in looking in a place that's only 10,000 years old. Um, we were also looking for a place that uh, was near the most important resource of all, which of course is water, and where the local tribes aren't hostile. Because Yemen is one of the most weaponized societies on earth, which I've always thought is really surprising, because Yemen sounds like a Jamaican dude chilling. Yaman. Yeah, 
I love Yemen. Like, one of the things I learned in Yemen, this is completely true, is that olive oil is great for uh, cooking with, for conditioning your hair, and for cleaning guns. <laughs> Which is ironic, because olive oil is supposed to make you live longer. Anyway, um, so then you jump into the Jeeps and you do the reconnaissance, which is basically covering really steep mountainous terrain in the Yemeni heat. Um, and you're carrying your gear and you're looking for and exploring these caves. Now, it doesn't get much more physically demanding than that. It really doesn't. Except if thanks to security protocol, you have to be prepared to do it wearing a burqa. I'm the second burqa on the right. I'm not. Um, actually, that, this day I decided it was safe enough to not wear a burqa. Um, and I ended up with the worst sunburn of my life. It's like, for fuck's sake. <laughs> you can't win. Um, we're actually a very small family group. We're very, sorry, not, we're a very small group, which is great because it looks like we're a family on a day trip. Um, only a family with trowels, shovels, and pickaxes. And as far as family groups go, with the Adams family. Um, and uh, I'm actually a National Geographic explorer, so National Geographic asked if they could send out a photographer with me. And I was like, cool, but you know, don't send me somebody that will stick out too much. You know, like, no gingers, come on, <laughs> seriously. <laughs> they were like, cool, well, maybe we can start sending you some pictures. I was like, just, hold on, just, just so we're clear, you're going to start sending me pictures of National Geographic photographers that can handle themselves in conflict zones. Oh my God, National Geographic is setting up a dating service for me. <laughs> Amazing. I was like, guys, I think what would really help his security is if he liked taking long walks on the beach. <laughs> and I just don't think the tribes would kidnap him if he was completely over his ex. <laughs> We've all been there. So, so yeah, so um, I was planning to head out. My last dig was scheduled for April 2015. Um, but the security situation out there was rapidly deteriorating. So uh, the US and UK embassies had moved out. The World Bank had moved out, which was really upsetting because some of us wanted to open an account with them. Um, <laughs> Actually, if, if you know your geopolitics, you know that the World Bank moving out is a bad sign. It's a sign that a country is about to be declared a failed state. So our security protocol was on acid. Um, but one of the things that was honestly scaring me the most was how on earth I was going to tell my massively overprotective Arab parents where I was heading to this time. I was uh, in Iraq six months ago, and I asked my sisters if I should just tell them that I was going to uh, Disneyland Paris. <laughs> so, I, I don't know if many of you know what Arab parents are like, but it's not that they cut the umbilical cord, it's that they turn it into a leash. My brother's a journalist, and he found himself at a protest being shot at. And his genuine first thought was, crap, if I die, mum's going to kill me. <laughs> Which is about right. Uh, my other big headache was um, that when you work in these kind of environments, it's actually quite hard to legally and ethically take things out of the country for further analysis. And things go missing a lot. Um, so I decided the best thing to do was to take in a laser scanner so there was a record, just in case. However, I became increasingly concerned about taking a laser scanner and all my gear into the rebel-controlled Sana airport in the capital. Um, I had an image of people thinking I was a spy. And I'd be like, no, 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 I'm not a spy, I'm not a spy, I'm an evolutionary biologist. And they'd be like, evolution? <laughs> ah, fuck it, fuck it, I'm a spy, I'm a spy. <laughs> I don't Can't deal with the aggro. So then I decided uh, it would be safer to fly into Aden Airport and take the road to, uh, up to the Highlands. Uh, but then I got word that a full-scale battle had broken out on the tarmac of Aden Airport. Um, but you have to love the Yemeni attitude, because within 12 hours of this battle breaking out, uh, the airport announced that all inbound and outbound flights had resumed as normal. <laughs> yeah, man. <laughs> so... Um, it must have been, I think it was like eight days before I was due to fly out. Um, a coalition of Arab countries started military strikes against the rebels, and they bombed Sana Airport. Yemen was now a no-fly zone. Now, I've, I've worked in places where battles have broken out before, um, but this was really, really very different. This was very personal. Um, there's something about watching your ancestral homelands, hospitals, its museums, 
Even my family's traditional stained glass windows, all blown up, damaged and destroyed. Uh, World Heritage sites were being hit. Uh, the Queen of Sheba's archeological site was hit. Remember the picture I showed you that my brother took? Um, this is a few roads down. It's also part of the UNESCO World Heritage Site. You should know that this is a contender for being one of the oldest continuously inhabited cities on Earth. This happened to it. Every time I see this picture, I really, really struggle. Um, five houses were destroyed. Uh, these houses are hundreds of years old, so they lean on each other for support. So the three houses next to them are now un uninhabitable. Um, Dr. Shelby, a cardiac doctor, was killed along with four of his family members. Uh, the when I first saw this picture, I was in tears. I think people have to understand that these places took our ancestors hundreds if not thousands of years to build. They represent the best of what we can create as humanity. They represent the soul of these places. And in an instant, these places were being destroyed. And somehow, and I can't explain why, it made it so much worse that barely anybody was talking about the destruction of life, the fear in my aunt's voice, the looting, the destruction of antiquities. You know, there's something kind of interesting about a comic depressing a room. It's a, it's a weird feeling to do that as a, as a stand-up. Um, I, I kind of have been reflecting on it since, and I've... Um, well, the nerd in me feels really stupid in hindsight that I was really upset when we lost Pluto. <laughs> I feel like, in hindsight, that was probably an overreaction. <laughs> I keep trying to find the funny in things. Um, and so I, uh, I, I remember thinking, well, if you're gonna blow the place up, you're kind of helping me a bit with the digging. <laughs> Only like, I have an image of turning up and like being like, oh, for fuck's sake, you blew up the missing link. <laughs> or being like, oh, well, this dinosaur clearly died of shrapnel damage. I don't know, I don't know. I told my sister that I, I genuinely think that our work now is more important than ever. And she was like, dude, do you really think that if you find a Neanderthal skull, everyone will be so happy that all the warring factions will be, you know, shaking hands on the front of Time magazine with you and a Neanderthal fossil? And I was like, no. <laughs> but you know what, anything's possible, right? Like, I don't know if you guys know this, but there's this Armenian girl here in America. Uh, she was filmed having sex. It was filthy. The film got out and it brought nothing but pride, fame, and fortune to the Kardashians. <laughs> I'm just saying anything's possible. <laughs> um, so when the worst of this war is over, uh, my team's good to go. We don't believe that development is just about aid. We believe that development is about science and it's about exploration as well. And you know what? I, I kind of think that the kids of Yemen deserve to know that they're more than statistics of war or child soldiers. They deserve to know that the front line of exploration is literally on their doorstep. Um, I'm gonna end um, by saying that I'm actually a very, very avid cyclist. Uh, but in Yemen, it's a massive taboo for women to cycle. But because of the blockades and the war, most of the cars are really struggling to put petrol in them. So a group of Yemeni women demanding their right to movement in a war, and also massively challenging social taboos, decided to take to their bikes in their burqas. So I'm going to end by just pointing out that how can you not have hope when this world has badass ninjas on bikes. <laughs> you guys have been awesome. Thank you.